Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be introducing Lee today. Uh, I'm sure Lee is very well known to most of you, so I probably uh, needn't go on with a, a lengthy preamble of all the wonderful things he's done in his illustrious career today, but I still feel obliged to talk about a few, a few snippets. Um, so he graduated in 1990 from the University of Alberta with a geophysics degree. He's been in our local Calgary-based industry ever since. Um, in 2014, he joined Jupiter Resources, where he's uh, presently employed, and uh, he really wanted me to emphasize how much he enjoys working with the Jupiter team there. A great, great company. Um, over the years, he's acted both as an interpreter and a BU manager. I think it's safe to say that your heart really lies on the interpretation side of things. And you've drilled over 250, 350 wells in Western Canada. Lee has numerous research interests, BBAZ, ABAZ, curvature, and, and so forth. Uh, he's garnered, as you're probably aware, many best paper, best presentation awards over the years. Far too numerous for me to mention in this quick introduction. He was the 2012 CSEG Distinguished Lecturer. He was uh, a founding member of the Value of Integrated Geophysics Steering Committee a few years back. Now, I wound up digging up some interesting stats, and Lee doesn't really want me to divulge them for fear of him coming off as being immodest, but I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to take license here and, and divulge them anyway. So in 2016, Scotiabank released a report of uh, the top producing gas wells for that particular year. And guess what? Fully the top five wells were from Jupiter, and they were drilled on the strength of Lee and his team's um, use of quantitative methods and critical thinking, those very things that he's so passionately championing these days. So I think that speaks volumes about, about uh, uh, Jupiter's workflow and, and their employee of geophysics and, and other geosciences. Okay, so I've got all the I've got all the unimpressive stuff out of the way, the boring stuff. Let me talk about the impressive stuff. The, the trait uh, which I admire most about Lee is actually his dogged determination in the face of adversity. And no doubt this trait comes out day by day in, in the workforce. But the context uh, in which I'm familiar with this trait actually has nothing to do with work. So here's, here's the, the scoop on, on things. Lee has a respiratory uh, issue, a pretty serious uh, issue, in that he is missing his right pulmonary artery. It's a pretty important artery. It supplies all the input blood to his right lung. So obviously it's a pivotal cog if you're interested in cardiovascular activities. So despite this limitation, Lee decided several years back that he wanted to engage in Ironman triathlons. And this choice hasn't been without some consequence. In his first attempt at an Ironman in Penticton, he actually had to stop halfway through because he started developing pulmonary edema. And um, then came round two. Instead of um, crumpling and saying, this is it for me, he decided I'm going out again. And uh, he, this time around, he needed a, a, a doctor's release to clear him to allow him to uh, participate in this, this second attempt at the Ironman. And I'm actually just going to read an excerpt from doctor's report. This is clearing Lee to participate. It is written by a, a respiratory specialist at Foothills Hospital. I think. And so I'm, I'm just reading this part verbatim. This letter has been provided to Mr. Hunt at his request. He wishes to compete in a triathlon, blah, blah, blah. And he, he has a history of having developed pulmonary edema with high levels of exercise in the past. He is obviously at risk, again, of developing this medical problem if he competes in a triathlon. And if he were to develop this problem, it could result in need for hospitalization or even death. It is impossible to quantitate the risk involved. I find that part ironic. He loves <laughs> So, so on, it, on it goes, and ultimately, uh, it clears him to, to compete. Now, there's a backstory to this. Uh, th this all took place in 2012. Lee, Lee was, had a site set on the 2012 Ironman triathlon. And, in Pecticton. And um, prior to that, some months prior to that, Lee was a distinguished CSEG lecturer, and he wanted me to introduce him. So there I was talking at the uh, convention center, introducing Lee, and Lee really wanted me to read this thing out at that time. And um, even Lee doesn't know this, but I, I basically I read the thing myself, and I chickened up. I was terrified after reading it. I thought, I don't want to. I don't want to read this out loud. He's yet to compete in the second triathlon. And, and somehow tinge this with tragic irony. I'm scared for him. So I chickened out Lee. And I, to this day, I felt bad about that. I'm happy to say Lee successfully completed that Ironman um, and has gone on a few other triathlon events. And um, I guess another, another thing worth noting, Lee is going to be uh, augmenting, not diminishing his cardiovascular uh, activity level. 
in the not too distant future because he's essentially transitioning out of geophysics and into other pursuits like rock climbing and, and road biking and, and so forth. So um, luckily today we've still got him with his geophysical cap on and um, he's going to be talking to us about how optimal parameterization of curvature has a profound and beneficial impact on assessing drilling hazards. The title of his talk, as you can see here, is, uh, well, it's not quite the same. I've got, I'll read the whole thing. Drilling hazard assessment and the best parameterization of seismic curvature attributes. Lee Hunt. So, uh, you know, Mike told this story about me and uh, Jackson, Jupiter, about that story. Uh, but I know that if we talk to each and every one of you, that you would all have your own story special thing or interesting thing or challenging thing in your life. Uh, so it's interesting to hear that because I know there's, well, we each have our own thing, right? And uh, so as we talk about this curvature and its parameterization, you know, each of us in this room are going to, at some point, if we haven't, think about attributes like curvature. And, uh, you know, at least we have this, this common adventure we'll have together and how we do this. So I'd like to start by asking a question. Who here has themselves had curvature run or tried to run it themselves with run it? Some of you run it, yes. And um, have you felt, okay, who here has felt like absolutely confident how it should be done? Yeah. Okay, so that's the adventure we're on today. We're going to talk about that. And I don't think we're going to leave being absolutely confident because we live in a world where we never know absolutely everything. But maybe we'll have shared a few experiences this experience, and we might learn something together. I should point out that uh, I was not alone in this. Satinder Chopra, Baja Besri, um, who's here, is right there, and Cole is hiding in the back corner. Cole Webster were uh, intimately involved in those wells that Mike were talking about for the whole team's wells. So uh, I acknowledge my co authors. And David, I acknowledge the other two of the teammates. Uh, that helps, uh, including Eric, that guy. And uh, as well, we recognize that this data we're going to show oh, is licensed from is that, SEI. That and that we've done a number of things to protect the value of their data, which includes removing the details of time scales and lateral scales. We'll give you an idea of the size of things, but we've had to be sure now. Right with now? their permission to I show this. The uh, also, Renjin Wen from Geomodeling. Uh, we've talked to him quite a few times, actually, about curvature. And some of our displays are in your software, so I should. All right. Do we miss anybody? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Next. Okay. So it's all about business, right? We're here to solve problems, all of us. And uh, this problem really comes from a business problem. It's identifying fractures, in particular, hopefully open fractures, that can create a hazard. What we see here are four different wells. They were all meant to be horizontals. And I'll just tell you a little story here. Cole, if I get anything wrong, pipe up, okay, buddy? All right, see this well here, this little very short red well with the zero above it? That was meant to be a horizontal well. It was not drilled by Jupiter. None of these wells were. They were drilled by our predecessor. This well was drilling along in the Spirit River in a flare sand, and suddenly they hit open fractures. They had uncontrollable blood problems, and they had to call it a day. Never got to complete it. Money was lost. Same thing happened with this well. Well, A got a little bit further out, hit open fractures, big mud losses, couldn't get it under control, it lost control materials, and that was it. Ruined well, nothing out of it. They, they actually did try to produce it, right, Cole, without completing it, and they flowed what? A couple million remaining points to really. And, and a lot of rock. Pieces. And they flowed, they flowed reservoir, which is interesting. Uh, so there was something really going on down there. Uh, but they were not to be deterred. And uh, they drilled a third horizontal well, which we'll call well B. And for a sense of scale, the lateral section of B is a little over 1,500 meters long. It's not particularly long well by today's standards. This is a few years ago. And what you're seeing here, these little disks are fracture density from an image log. No image log in an invert system couldn't tell us what the fractures were open or closed. They could tell us what the density were. And it's been upscaled. <coughs> Uh, which we have to do to eventually compare it to the size of it. And you can see, you know, if we drew a line between well zero and well A, you know, you might think maybe there's something going here. We don't know that for a fact. Um, but you can see that the biggest disks 
from this image log are you know in that vicinity of certainly where well zero uh, gave it up. Uh, so that's very interesting. The fracture orientations were all over the map. Uh, so it's quite complicated. One of the things, it was not an HTI type environment, which would complicate whether you can come at this with a meaningful uh, approach to life. Okay, uh, later there was also well, well C uh, that was drilled fine, and there was some interesting limestone describing the samples which we believe were actually fractured though. Uh, but there were no real problems from uh, open fractures. So there's this idea that there might be some you know, particular set of fractures uh, that were problematic for us here. Um, interestingly enough, there were fractures all along this well bore. There were some everywhere. There was this background set of fractures that are all over. There's just more in some places than others. Okay, so really what our goals are, fractures aren't bad for us unless we have too many of them, or unless we're not ready for them. Uh, so there's an idea of identifying when it might be hazardous. Okay, so what are our goals? Our goals are that question I asked you, you know, what should our parameters be? Do they matter? And a little background would be um, for those that were at uh, the CSCG February lunch of last year, we talked about methods and reason like Mills methods and VR yields. We look at curvature as a set of one of many complementary tools that we might use to try to understand problems that we're dealing with. When we are talking about curvature, how do we get uh, the best curvature. And it's worthwhile thinking that uh, we should have in mind what we care about here. How we look at things depends on what we see, or affects what we see. And in this case, we think we have low magnitude faults. Could be a very small fault, or it could be a, a set of fractures. Whatever it is, probably not all that big. Big enough to maybe ruin your day. But it's <coughs> worth knowing that and trying to decide what should my parameters look like? Because I can make parameters that are good at seeing gigantic things, or parameters where I'm trying to see small things. And so when we're sitting here thinking, I want to solve this problem, like maybe drill more around here, should I consider that when I'm looking at my uh, parameterization of curvature? So that's a thought. Let me go to the next slide there. So as an outline, uh, I've basically been introducing the problem. We'll talk about our evaluation procedure. Surely uh, just about everything in geoscience it's difficult to evaluate objectively, and we're going to try here. Um, but we're going to start by defining the nature of curvature parameters. What are the big problems? And then we're going to look at our evaluation procedure. We'll start with what kind of lines are we going to look at. We'll look at lines in cross-section view. We'll look at maps and map-based evaluation uh, techniques. And we'll kind of roll up what our methodology will look like. So as we scroll through things, you can kind of think where we're going. Uh, then we'll actually perform the map and line comparison. Once we really get started, when I've done this lengthy introduction, once we're all ready, this will happen very quickly. We'll just flip through a bunch of different results and try different parameters. We'll do the same thing with the lines. We will make correlations with that one image log of fracture density that we have. It by itself doesn't form you know, a very big evaluation set. So by itself, it doesn't give you the full answer. We need to look at the maps and lines as well. And we'll try to roll it up. I think we'll make some conclusions. At that point, you know, I, I'm going to tell you my opinion of things. But you'll have your own opinion, and hopefully we can discuss it. Like I said, this is an adventure we're going to share uh, together. And then each of us will probably go back and at some point, you know, encounter this question set again. OK, Mike. All right, so first, what is curvature? Well, it's really an idea that we're talking about a surface that's curved. And there's some mathematics around it, but it's related to the second derivative. Um, and we often think of, uh, or in fact, Robert showed this in uh, 2001, we think of a beam of a certain length that gets bent, and that part of it gets extended, and part of it gets uh, contracted. This is creating strain in that beam, and that, that would potentially create fractures in it. If this was the Earth, it might potentially create fractures from that strain relationship. So curvature has some strain relationship, strain relationship potentially to fractures. So we're talking about curvature to talk about fractures. It's an inference. Um, in no sense, I think, if we were making correlations or trying to do some objective mathematical work, would we ever expect this to be a deductive argument? This is far too inferential. However, there is reason to expect that it will have some directional uh, proportionality, maybe with other information that you have. So this is going to be inductive, and we shouldn't expect a perfect answer. 
It's not perfectly predictable. OK, so how do we measure curvature? Well, uh, Ren Jin Wen uh, reminded me that really the idea of curvature is we shouldn't have a horizon. And in fact, the easiest and first ways that people would, well, geologists actually, would measure curvature from the field and make a map. Um, the first way to do it with seismic was we would pick a horizon and then try to estimate curvature from the horizon pits. The unfortunate thing about that is, is that uh, horizon-based curvature is affected by everything that affects how you pick horizons, like how they tend to snap to troughs, peaks, and zero crosses, which is often good, but sometimes isn't. And it's limited by what we really can pick, certainly. So there's nothing wrong with curvature from a horizon when you can use it. Um, but to avoid the interpretive problems, uh, some years ago, people moved on to dinner, um, trying to estimate curvature from a volume, which actually complicates your work. Uh, because you've got to take this volume and use some sort of similarity measure in a portion of it and try to get an idea of all the dips in that volume that then you relate to curvature. Uh, so it's certainly not as direct because you have to take a volume. It's not like having a surface, which is time localized. It's necessarily as time localized. It's not as direct, but you might avoid some problems. In either case, once you have dips and derivatives, you solve a problem. And uh, basically, this is a problem in derivatives of the x, y, and x, y directions. And uh, you solve for the weights, and then you arrange these things, and you get various kinds of curvature that you're interested in. Thank you, Mike. Now, we need to know just a little bit more here. So how does it actually happen when those of you, and it's quite a lot of us, have tried to or have calculated curvature? How do we do it? Well, if it's a horizon, it's fairly simple. We generally, most software, you choose an x and a y. And that's about it. Uh, so it's the size of data that dips in a polynomial or calculated. And the assumption is probably the polynomial is chosen off of the data within that x, y size range. And so you just figure out which it is that you want to use. Not too hard to test. From a volume, it's a little more complicated. You've got to go to these cuboids. You have a cuboid of data that's in an x and a y, that's your spatial scales, and a z time or depth scale. And quite often, z is uh, much larger, at least in terms of samples, not necessarily size, but z would be larger in samples than x or y. And you've got to choose all three of those. Dips are calculated, so we've got a kind of a similarity function living within this volume of data. And it gets an idea of the dip of the data there, with some degree of complexity depending on whose solution you have. We then solve that uh, polynomial. We might have a question whether the polynomial is solved on exactly the same size of data as the cuboid. It may or may not be. Most software, I think it probably is, but it will fill every piece of software. I think the ARCA solution is actually slightly different. But <coughs> Now, what often happens with the volume method is that certain filtering might be applied to the results. And that filtering uh, can be nothing to a Gaussian weighting, which we'll talk about here today, or even kind of some specialized Fourier filtering. Um, the solution that Arcus has, which is one of the ones that we tested, uh, uses a specialized kind of Fourier filtering. And if you want to understand that, you got to go and look at uh, El Basri and Marford's 2006 paper where they talk about that. When they talk about the Fourier filter that's commonly applied, they use something called an alpha number from their paper. That alpha number defines which wavelengths are allowed to come through. And I'll just say that if Satinder is running your curvature for you, this is actually important because Satinder's going to say, oh, I'm going to give you a low frequency and a high frequency or a long wavelength and a short wavelength answer. But which alphas are those? Like, when we're done talking here, if you don't already know how to have that conversation with Satinder, you will. Because we'll talk about specific alpha numbers. And it's worth talking about those parameters because they can matter to what you're looking at, the scale that you're interested in. Uh, so those are just some interesting things. So filtering commonly applied after we figure out the dips and solve the polynomial. Um, so the question here that we're all wondering as we've spent all of this time um, is, it doesn't really matter what size x, y, z are. When uh, we have done this ourselves, the choices that we've made, how important were they? And does it matter what filtering, if any, follows? Well, it's probably the question. <coughs> so that's, that's really what we're here for. And I think those are the big knobs you need to think about. 
All right, so later in the talk, well, it's going to follow here, that we're going to look at lines. And we'll look at two seismic lines, these white lines up. North one and the south one. And the north one sort of comes across well B, and the south one actually almost follows well B. So we will look at those two lines. In the background, um, we have a time structure map. Almost all of the color bars are the same. Low times or low values of curvature will be kind of purple. And either high times or high values of curvature will move towards the red from the yellows. Okay? Thanks. So this is uh, the north and the south seismic line. And um, the little feature that we're kind of interested in is right here. And you can see it's kind of subtle. This whole section I'm showing you, that's about 600 mils of data. And this is about 1,500 meters approximately across. Got a little arrow. Whenever we look at the lines, we're going to point the arrow at about an interesting spot where we kept having our problems. When we look at the south line, this goes by well A. That's one of the wells that was ruined. They produced reservoir rock as well as gas. And you can actually see this little dipsy doodle here, kind of up and down a little bit. And that's it's sort of interesting. And you can see that here's what's kind of cool, is there's a pretty pickable event very close to us. So we could try a horizon-based method. But once we're between that horizon and about the wall, then things get a little harder to pick. OK. And this is just an idea. OK, so here's the two seismic lines, north and south. And this is actually curvature. This is Arcus' solution with an alpha of 0.4, which incidentally is most commonly what you call the long wavelength. And you can see the curvature in the background. This is uh, most positive curvature. That's all we're going to talk about today for simplicity. <coughs> and it's saying I'm curved. I've got an apex here. On the south line where that uh, well A ended, there's a curvature event right here. Okay. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to see. And I'm just going to show you the colors later. Right. OK. So now this is, uh, we're just setting the stage for evaluation. And one of the things that we want to use to help evaluate in a map sense is uh, the diffraction imaging and diffraction imaging. And uh, so what I've got is a time structure on the right and diffraction imaging at about our zone of interest on the left. And the diffraction imaging is, I would say, very difficult to interpret. Oh, what would you say? Yeah. It's, it's a challenge. We value it quite a lot, but it's challenging to work with. Um, and you can see there's some interesting events. And if you look at this one, you see this arcuate event. It was very close to where that well zero is hidden by well B. It goes right where well A kind of ended and it comes across here. Next slide. And we just draw a little line there where we think may be the offending feature that's giving us our open fractures. Of course, it's <coughs> one of a lot of features. It can be hard to decide which of the features we see in curvature and fraction imaging are our problem. And at the February 2016 technical luncheon, we talked about the importance of using more than one kind of uh, information to help give you an idea of risk. We use the um, idea from inductive reasoning of, of the complex V argument, where we would take things like curvature, rock properties, diffraction imaging, and maybe even azimuthal methods, all completely independent kinds of information, or at least mostly independent. And we decide if all three of these or all of these things pointed towards fractures, we would feel that we had a better confidence. Of it. We do not view that you should run curvature but not diffraction imaging or one or the other. These are the best things done in concert. That's why I'm showing you these things. Um, and we talked a little bit about using Mills methods and how you would organize this information. So that's uh, one of the reasons we show diffraction imaging. It's just another kind of very loose cross validation that really is. Okay, so let's just bear this in mind. In a few minutes, I'm going to be showing you image after image after image. I say it'll happen fast, but let's bear in mind what our game plan is. <coughs> we're going to evaluate based on the maps that we see, and we're going to ask ourselves if the key features kind of look like they could be something geologic that we would expect as either structural geologists or, or, or whatever, but some expectation. We'll ask ourselves if they're similar to the diffraction imaging line that I showed you. We'll evaluate the seismic lines and see if that gives us some clue. These are sort of semi-qualitative uh, in nature. Lastly, we'll evaluate based upon the correlations to the image log. So that's going to be our game plan. And we'll fill in a little chart later. And you may have different opinions for me. If you feel differently, don't feel angry, because you can't disagree. 
Um, but we'll talk about the horizon based or um, method. We'll also have a linearly weighted cuboid. So it'll be volume based curvature, but it's just going to be a cuboid with no filtering after the fact. And we have a number of different sizes that we'll test there. We'll talk about a Gaussian weighted cuboid. So this is the cuboid method, <coughs> volume method, but then has a Gaussian filter applied to it. And we'll talk about the Fourier filtered uh, method, which uses a small cuboid. And uh, you just correct me if I'm wrong, Sakinder. But the Arcus method uses a cuboid, just like these other two to start, like I said. And their cuboid is quite small. It's smaller than most of the cuboids here. Uh, and then they do the filtering afterwards. So it's, it's worth knowing that theirs is kind of small, because we'll talk about small, large cuboids here. There may be an advantage or disadvantage in sizing. Okay, so let's start. This is map-based. We'll take a few minutes now, and it'll get faster and faster as we go. Map-based curvature, you can see where all the wells are. Um, and we're looking at, um, on the left, a 9 by 9. So 9 inlines, 9 cross lines. Go calculate curvature. That's all there is to it. You can do that on, on most interpretation software, something very like this. Versus an 11 by 11 solution. And it's kind of interesting because both of them kind of have this spidery, um, huge amount of uh, curvature apparently measured here. And that's actually caused by a picking problem. Our zero crossing gets a little bit uh, complex there. And, and so it does some things that create some apparent curvature. However, some of it could be real. Uh, the only difference between the sizes of the window is just a little bit of maybe the size of those. Okay. So that's 9 by 9 versus 17 by 17. Next slide. Now we're going to go to the linearly weighted cuboid. So this is uh, the volumetric base one with no filtering afterwards. And what we're using is a cuboid first, 3 by 3 by 98. It means we just got 3 by 3 in the x, y direction. We're 98 milliseconds long. So this is a really long cuboid in samples. Uh, and that is shown here on the left. And beside it is 5 by 5 by 98. And if we look at this in a map sense, this is very noisy, the 3 by 3 by 98. Um, the 5 by 5 by 98 is also noisy, uh, but it looks like a little bit more of a story is coming out. You might notice in both of them that we could say there might be a feature kind of like what we expected from the diffraction imaging that might be a potential interpretation of what's going on between that well 0 and well A. And you can sort of see that thing on the 5 by 5 by 98. So let's continue. So now we see 5 by 5 by 98 versus 7 by 7 by 98. We'll just change one at a time, OK? So we go from 5 by 5 by 98 to 7 by 7 by 98. The answer is just getting a little bit more clear and a little less noisy, OK? And when we go now 7 by 7 by 98 versus 9 by 9 by 98, most of what you see in these two images they're essentially the same, not exactly the same. Very similar, just a little bit less noisy in the 9 by 9. Go to the next one. Let's work our way up. 9 by 9 by 98 versus 11 by 11. Um, very similar answer. We'll continue. Now it's 9 by 9 by 98, which we're using as our main reference. Um, Baha and I have used 9 by 9 by 98 a fair bit when we use this particular algorithm. And this is 17 by 17, um, and it's you can actually see that it's quite a bit of a bigger scale. It's starting to look a little different, but most of the features are, you can tell they're sort of related. They come from the same data. OK, Mike? Uh, we tried another thing. Now, you're, many of you are thinking 9 by 9 by 98, that's really long. I can tell you that is way longer than what Satyendra would use for his cuboid. It's like four times longer. Uh, how about something shorter? with this method. When we go to a shorter window, so 9 by 9 by 98 versus 9 by 9 by 46, the answer started to change a lot. Um, it got a little bit, uh, I'd say, messier looking. It's hard to say at this point that it's wrong, but it's different. Let's go to even shorter. So here's 9 by 9 by 22, and while things are really looking kind of interesting through here, this idea of this arcuate shape is more or less lost. Um, and let's keep going. Let's do another comparison. Ah, now let's compare the horizon-based method, which is really time localized, versus this very short window 9 by 9 by 22. 
And this big mess of energy is starting to kind of look a little bit like that the horizon base, which is very interesting. The window is kind of getting caught up in this zero crossing business that we talked about. So um, it's cool that there could be an end member between a volumetric method and a horizon based method where they start to have some similar characteristics, but they're never exactly the same. All right. Oh, and this is the 9x9x98 nine by nine by that we preferred versus the horizon based. And it's worth showing you um, just because they are so very different. So what was similar, what was different. Now let's move on to a different kind of curvature. We've done horizon based, we've done the cuboid that's linearly weighted. Now we'll talk about a Gaussian filter. So you do this cuboid method of volume, and now you have a Gaussian filter. And some people use this. Uh, the particular solution that we had didn't, it wasn't easy to understand what its parameters were. You know it's just one by five or two by nine. Well, the one represents a Gaussian size in both X and Y, which are the same. And the nine, a five represents the vertical size. And it isn't five vertical samples. It's quite a bit larger. That's more like 30 uh, milliseconds, uh, but it's smaller. All we can really understand from this is software provider told me they don't really want their clients to know, because it just gets annoying, um, is that uh, 1 by 5 is small versus 2 by 9, which is larger. So here's the 1 by 5 solution, and it kind of reminds me, it has this mess around well A of some of the shorter linear weighted cuboids of the horizon method. Whereas the 2 by 9 is starting to get the hint of that arcuate shape here. Let's go to the next one. So 2 by 9 versus 3 by 10, they're kind of mostly similar now. Let me go to the next one. 2 by 9 versus 5 by 10. Now, if you guys and girls were a little closer, there's some little whiskers in here. There's actually some artifacts that come from Gaussian filtering itself that are quite interesting. And when they get real big, like, well, do you want to talk about our scaling experiments and how this came up? Yeah, we just went to a size where we got to the point where it was too big and the, the artifacts presented themselves as uh, <laughs> unignorable to the point where you would interpret them as perhaps different from true features. Yeah, so we couldn't use it. Yeah. And what was going on there was, you know, we recognized why do we care about these, these sizes? We talked about it's because of the, it's because of our target, right? Well, there are certain, when you look at a, a large structural feature, you'll often see it could be a big anticline, but it could have little features in it, big ones. And sometimes you want to represent and look at the big feature, and sometimes you want to look at the small feature. And we re realized that we would like a very low frequency result. And we started pumping the size of this thing up until it came apart. And you know you couldn't see because of the artifacts. So filtering can get out of control. Um, but there is there are a lot of real reasons to want to look at different scales here. I should point out, like to go back to the earliest people that thought about uh, things looking at different scales, curvature, they're geologists in some of the AAPG journal articles. You'll see geologists talking about filtering for different wavelengths. It's, it's a very reasonable thing to try to do. Okay, let's uh, carry on. Okay, so here's a comparison of the horizon based method, 9 by 9 horizon, <coughs> versus the 1 by 5 Gaussian weighted. And you know, you kind of, there's some similarities here. Just going back to this time localization of things. Go to the next one. Um, so now let's compare the Gaussian weighted to what was our favorite of that method. 2 by 9 Gaussian weighted versus 9 by 9 by 98. The Gaussian weighted has a little cleaner look to it, but they share a lot of similar features. We'll carry on. Uh, we're going to carry on to the Fourier method, which is what Marcus has. Um, so here we have an alpha of 0.2 versus 0.4. And the thing about these alpha numbers is this is controlling um, the Fourier filtering of your result, okay? And the smaller the alpha number, the larger the wavelength, okay? Or the lower the frequency. So when you look at um, 0.2, this would be very low, lower than you would normally get if you talk to um, Argus here about running this kind of thing. You would have to specifically, if you wanted something this low, you would have to say, I want 0.2. What you will normally get is 0.4 beside it. If you looked at them, they're actually fairly similar. We've done some experiments getting larger and larger curvature, and uh, sometimes there's a reason to do this like I was getting at before. Um, but they're fairly similar, and this arcuate shape is uh, definitely there in both uh, answers. This is now 0.4 versus 0.65. So now we're getting into 
um, shorter wavelength, higher frequency. Um, and you can kind of see there's some more detail coming out here. And now we're looking at 0.4 versus 0.8. And is this what you would call the like short wavelength? Yeah, 0.8 would be your short wavelength. Interesting, you just go back one slide. Okay, so you could say to Satinder, well, don't give me 0.8, give me 0.65. We can have that conversation with him. Um, or you can try a couple in between. It might be something you're interested in. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's uh, compare some things now again. So the 5 by 5 by 98 versus the alpha 0.65, possibly similar. They're not the same. Um, the 9 by 9 by 98 versus the alpha 0.4, possibly similar. Um, and this is the 11 by 11 by 98 versus the alpha. Awesome. Will you go back about five slides? I just want to go to the point two versus point four, the very first one. Yeah. Now there's something I failed to mention uh, in this particular solution that's worth talking about. You see these features? We're talking about curvatures. This is sound confusing, but there's curved features in the curvature, curved in x y, and this particular solution uh, does the best job for actually handling those curved features. And you got to think. I'm taking a cuboid of data, I'm trying to find the dips in x and y, then I'm trying to solve this polynomial in all these different directions. The sophistication with which you do that is important, and um, I think that the argument is, is that there's a little more sophistication in your solution um, for how you actually get a 3D sense out of this curvature. It's just a subtle thing, but you can actually see more curvature. Let's go back to our comparisons. Um, forward, forward, back. Yeah, forward. And, yeah, so Okay, so we see some curved features here. They were a little more trouble there. Um, you know, in the old linearly weighted cuboid. Uh, and you can see some of that in these others. And we can carry on. So this is the 1, 1 by 5 Gaussian weighted versus the alpha of 0.8. And I would say that uh, the short wavelength is very high frequency. And it's more high frequency than anything else I can get, actually. Okay. All right. That's the map comparison. Let's go on to the line comparison and we'll just remind ourselves what we're looking at. We'll always show you the north line and the south line. We'll do the same kind of comparative style. The arrows will point to you know, where we expected big fractures to be. Let's see what things look like. Okay, let's go. We can't show you the horizon base because there is no cross-sectional view. Remember, it's just not a horizon. And that's another reason, I think, why the volumetric based curvature is a little more popular because you can see a volume of this, um, which makes more sense when we're trying to interpret what is the cause of the curvature feature. Makes a lot of sense. Oh, okay, so here's our arrows. This is 3 by 3 by 98 versus 5 by 5 by 98. And the 3 by 3 by 98 is essentially uninterpretable. So imagine trying to solve this polynomial on that size of the area. That doesn't make a lot of sense. You can start to see it. If some of you are a fair bit away. If you want to look at these slides and I've done talking, you can come look at There's a lot of noise in here. So let's uh, up the size here. So now we're 5 by 5 by 98 versus 7 by 7. Essentially, the information is largely the same, not exactly the same, but largely the same. But it's a little less noisy at 7 by 7. Let's carry on. Now we're seeing 7 by 7 versus 9 by 9. It's quite a bit cleaner. Um, the scale has changed it's a tiny amount, really, but not much. But this is a cleaner result. You can sort of see, you know, some effects of that vertical video. Um, but it looks fairly natural, maybe, at this point. Okay, 9 by 9 by 98 versus 11 by 11. Now it's starting to get very clean and it's starting to spread out for the next one. This is the 17 by 17. And now, like a sharp feature that ended well, A is starting to get taken apart in the, in the cross-section sense. So it looked okay in the map. In the cross section, you know, if we were trying to understand what's going on here, we might be thinking we've gone a bit too far on the size. Go to the next one. Okay, what about, remember we did those short, we tried to shorten the time window. This is 9 by 9 by 98 versus 9 by 9 by 22, and good lord, it really is coming apart on us. It does, this vertical striking, this, the effect of the window is, is very clear to us. Let's go to the next one. If it's just a little bigger, 9 by 9 by 46, you still get this striping, and uh, it makes it a little harder to interpret. And what you might surmise from these comparisons is the angst that we're feeling over this incredibly long time window. Uh, 
because uh, it's a very long window to try to compare dips. Things change. Um, but when we tried to shorten the window, we ended up having problems. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the Gaussian weighted. This is the 1 by 5 versus the 2 by 9. And the 1 by 5 has some of these kind of stability issues. The banding tool is it's vertical size of the keyboard. The 2 by 9 looks actually a little bit better. We'll go to the next one. So now we have 2 by 9, which would be our most preferred one with the Gaussian method compared to 3 by 10. Uh, and isn't a lot of advantage really getting larger here. And when you go to the 5 by 10, if, again, if you came real close, you'll actually see those are artifacts that are showing up from the Gaussian filter. So now we'll just compare the 2 by 9 Gaussian versus the 9 by 9 by 98. And, you know, they have some similarities to the cross section view. We'll go to the next one, um, which is now talking about um, the Fourier filter approach. And uh, it um, looks very clean. You don't see this kind of banding, which is interesting because the cuboid that's used for this is very small. As I mentioned, it's the smallest of the cuboids that we've had. Um, but it doesn't have that other problem. You know, we can see this feature in end of well A. So here we have alpha 0.2 versus alpha 0.4. We'll go to the next slide. Now 0.4 versus 0.65, a little more detail. It's hard for me to keep the um, color scales exactly perfect. I'll go to the next one. <clears throat> now we look at 0.4, which we kind of liked, versus 0.8. And you might ask yourself if the 0.8 is kind of coming apart or not. Um, interesting. Go to the next slide. Now let's compare a few things. Alpha 0.4 versus 9 by 9 by 98. Um, they share some similarities, but they are not exactly the same. Uh, they come from two completely different algorithms, well, partly different. It's probably a little lower frequency on the alpha point. Okay. Next one, uh, alpha point eight versus nine by nine by nine eight is not at all the same. Okay. And this is the two by nine Gaussian weighted versus the alpha point four. And these share some similarities. Okay, so we're trying to figure this stuff out. We're probably starting to put a few things together. Let's go on to, we want to make these correlations. We want to have an objective method, right? I'm going to show you just very briefly the map data, curvature data, up against this, um, this fracture density. And then we'll talk about correlation coefficients, but we'll make it seem a little more real for you. So let's pay close attention to these disks and thinking about the kind of patterns through the wells. All right. Okay, so this is the Fourier filtered method alpha of 0.8. You know, we're kind of looking at where most of the fractures are, where well zero ends, where well A ends, and you sort of see this feature here, and there's some complex things going on there that may actually have meaning. Um, the image log sort of suggests that. Ah, I don't know if that was coming apart, I don't like it where it actually means something. I'd like another couple of those fracture densities. But it's, it's interesting that at least uh, most of the action is here, OK? Um, now we can go to an alpha of 0.65. And this would be something you specifically talk to Subtinder about. So it's worth kind of knowing about these things. This has suddenly become quite a bit more stable. If you go back once more to see now, go forward, 0.8 to 0.65. That is in this data a little easier to kind of understand some of what's going on. Thanks, Mike. Let's carry on. And so this is now an alpha point two, and again, it sort of talks about this feature and how it's seen at different wavelengths. I think I'd point out that if you were to use this kind of method and you talked about which alpha methods you want, it isn't about being right or wrong. It's about trying to investigate what the scales are telling you. And they will have a limit of what they can do in terms of what coverage is actually in the data, what coverage you can actually estimate. So, you know, trying a number of things is not bad. But having an idea of what we're out is, is what's going to get us there quicker. Okay. So this is the horizon-based method. And again, you know, it's got some stuff that might correlate to this image log, but it really draws your eye elsewhere. Okay. Uh, this is Gaussian weighted, and again, it's kind of got some real similarities. Most of the volumetric curvature results in a map sense, had some strong similarities. And 
This is the linearly weighted cuboid 9 by 9 by 22, and it's kind of junky looking, I think, we carry on. This is the 9 by 9 by 98, and it kind of has back to that feature we think might be real. And that is 11 by 11 by 98, kind of similar. This is actually diffraction imaging, and like we say, it's kind of hard to interpret. But on a larger scale, this arcuate shape actually has quite a bit of extent, stands out. I uh, just want to show you that. Not a slam dunk understanding of the space. Okay, so this is a whole lot of correlations, and we're never going to all memorize these right now, um, but let's just talk about them a little bit. Uh, so we're going to go through the types of algorithms, the horizon based, the nearly weighted cuboid, Gaussian weighted cuboid, um, the Fourier filtered method, and diffraction imaging. We have the different sizes, the parameters. Um, we've taken, we've done tested quite a bit more than this, but this is enough, I think. We have the correlation coefficients to fracture density. It's all upscaled. And I've just supplied the correlation coefficients to our diffraction imaging result just along that well B. And um, if it's colored dark yellow, it means it's considered statistically significant correlation. And the uh, horizon-based results actually have a correlation coefficient that doesn't look too bad, but that map view kind of upset me. The linear weighted cuboid uh, did not do very well at any of the smaller scales. When we started getting into the larger scales and the longer time windows, we started to see correlation coefficients that uh, might have been significant. The Gaussian weighted cuboid were basically around 0.5 for their correlations, not too bad at all. And very similar to the uh, Fourier filtered correlation coefficients, which got as high as about 0.56. All of the results actually had just a, a uh, meaningful correlation there with diffraction imaging, at least along that one look at the data. Okay. And this is just uh, the kind of thing that you guys and girls would want to do, which is say, well, let's look at the logs. So here it is, well B, uh, the uh, gamma ray log. And this is the original fracture density. And so it's in fractures per meter. And then we had to upscale it to seismic scales. So this is what we want to compare to. And here are all of our different results. And the first one is the horizon-based. Uh, it says 7 by 7. No, it must be, I did a 7 by 7. And you can see we have a lot of um, curvature here and here. And that's kind of where things are more or less. That's why there was a correlation coefficient. If we look at our 9 by 9 by 98 linearly weighted cuboid, um, it's kind of got stuff in the same place. In fact, all of the curvature results kind of have a bunch of energy here and kind of a bunch of energy there. And that's why they correlate. Uh, the better ones were the 2 by 9 Gaussian and uh, alpha 0.8 and 0.2. But they all look kind of similar. So that's the world we'd be living in if that's all we're doing. We're trying to look at the maps at the same time. Right. The next one. Now, we're going to just start to roll this up. We've got this is the second last slide, I think. So, an opinion. Um, if we looked at the horizon based, the small size map response had a lot of artifacts. The correlation may have been significant, but I didn't buy it looking at the map. And the bigger size horizon based method, 17 by 17, maybe had less artifacts. The linearly weighted cuboid. Um, had poor correlations to the fracture density, um, but some of them kind of looked okay on the map response. When we got really large with this, um, very large XYs, things kind of looked washed, but if we got to short time windows, the results degraded. So we were really stuck trying to find the perfect parameterization. This ended up being quite long in time and short in an X and Y direction. Very interesting. Uh, the Gaussian weighted results, kind of a medium size, like the 2 by 9. Gave the best results, very small did not, very large did not. It sort of had to be Goldilocks just right. Um, the Fourier filtered uh, results, uh, we kind of got um, pretty good results uh, through most of the spatial frequencies. I did not show you what happened if we made long time windows with the Fourier filtered results, but they were actually as good. I'll go to the next slide. So let's just roll this up. The horizon implementation. I am not saying don't do this. It's fast, and it's an entirely reasonable thing to do. Um, however, you've got to be careful that the pick-based artifacts don't get you, and you know you won't have this volume to look at. 
but a perfectly reasonable thing to do. The linear weighted cuboid, we spent a lot of time with it. It was good in some ways too. It was very sensitive to parameterization though, and it required big time. It was bigger in our data than we would have thought. Now, if your data is different, you might not take these incredible images of time windows, but ours did. The Gaussian weighted implementation, it was the medium sized parameterization that was good, but we had less control over the fine tuning of that. It was tricky that way. Probably the Fourier filtering implementation, and I'll say this without, I'm not being paid by her. Um, but uh, we think it's the most robust to parameterization, and the curve features seem to be much better there. Um, probably that robustness gives us an advantage in this time localization. It was the only one that could really get the cuboid small and it could still give a robust answer, so that was useful. And that's our theme. <laughs> be nice to hear you words. We can look at any of these slides, I'm not talking. Sorry, I was still wrong. Any questions for Lee? Sure, there must be many. You always done a lot of testing on it. Um, do, do you think it's the data volume or the geology that would control the parameters? Well, I think they both would. You know, a lot of what we do is a chain of things, and anything that goes wrong affects everything. So uh, it's both are going to matter. And you know, you might be in a data volume where an area where data volume quality changes very little, geology would be dominant. You might be an area where the quality changes a lot, but that'll be done. So you're going to have to go for it. It'll also depend on whether you have a shallow target, or whether you have a very deep target, or whether you have somewhere in intermediate. Right. So a parameterization also depends on that. Very well. What's your views in filtering before running commercial, like in structural oriented filters? Yeah, we, we did that and we need to do it. That'd be like a whole other two hours, figuring out all the ways and ins and around this. That is important. Speaker has more experience with that. Well, um, <clears throat> the thing is that Kovacharan, um, as uh, Lee pointed out in, the, in his very first or second slide, is a second order derivative measure. So if your data has noise, the second derivative that you take for the noise samples is going to blow it up. So it makes real sense to first filter out your noise and then take all these derivative measures. That's my take on that. You might get away with, um, you know, a coherence attribute without any structure or your filtering. It will probably be okay. But if you want a really neat kind of a display on coherence also, you should run the, the structure. And then, of course, uh, added to this is um, the fact that uh, you can always, uh, you know, sharpen some of your discontinuities. You yeah. use some kind of a Kuahara type of filtering and sharpen up and then run these attributes. Uh, they tend to sort of give you crisper. Uh, linear mix that you're looking for. Some of your curvature maps seem to kind of show uh, an orientation that's inline cross line direction. Is that a processing or a acquisition kind of artifact that you've seen in a lot of data sets or what are your thoughts? Well, our data is interpolated and we try to minimize those things. But uh, that uh, some of that could still be there is, doesn't surprise us at all. Um, and yeah, we do see to greater and lesser degrees in the comments. Well, um, I mean, if the data has artifacts, obviously they're going to be accentuated when you run any of these um, you know, uh, curvature or coherence measures. And um, it, it makes sense to first uh, you know, get rid of any kind of artifact, be, be um, confident that those are not there. And then you'll believe more on the attribute that you're not believe. Other than that, uh, you know, at least I know it could be it could be there. Yeah, we're never 100 percent confident. You gotta try some things for sure. So no more questions? Well, thanks for uh, paying attention to the long story and uh, the, uh, the personal introduction, by the way. <coughs> uh, I guess the way to wrap it up, what I meant to by this, is uh, it's an adventure together. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Let us wait for the adventure. I think we'll call on Satinder now to thank our esteemed geophysical orator, Mr. Hunt.
Hi, well, um, this is uh, with great pleasure I would like to thank uh, Lee for a very illuminating and uh, uh, an interesting talk because uh, not very often we see a talk that is focused only on the parameterization of an attribute. So that way, of course, this talk is uh, unique. And as uh, Mike said in his um, uh, introductory remarks, uh, Lee is um, an in individual who is uh, well grounded in the geosciences, and we've seen that over the years, uh, his talks at the conventions and workshops and uh, the symposiums. Um, and uh, he's well regarded in our geophysical fraternity. <clears throat> I've found Lee to, um, to be always uh, you know, working with passion, and you may have seen that. The, the amount of time he spent on just to understand the parameterization of the different algorithms, uh, in itself, it is very creditable. Very, not very often I come across uh, clients who do this. And uh, uh, you know, on a personal note, I've uh, found Lee to be very gracious and uh, generous in many ways. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank him for that. Now that he's uh, decided to move on, and uh, you know, he's um, probably felt he's had enough of geophysics, and he wants to pursue other uh, interests, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, let us um, put our hands together for a fabulous and a fantastic a career that Kali has had and hope and wish that the next phase of his life will be equally enjoyable um, and, uh, and uh, even more. So we are going to miss you.